Okay, so in our final step of aerobic respiration, we're finally going to use all of those electrons and hydrogens in the electron transport chain. So starting with glycolysis in the cytoplasm, when we split sugar into two three-carbon pyruvates, um, throughout those reactions, we actually reduced uh, two electron carriers, which means we added electrons and hydrogens to two NAD pluses uh, to carry them over to the electron transport chain. So if you are in an advanced biology class, basically NAD plus gained electrons and hydrogens forming NADH. And they were taken to the electron transport chain, whereas we can see the electrons and the hydrogens were donated into the electron transport chain. Uh, then the pyruv oh, made two ATPs. The pyruvate of three carbons enters into the matrix of the mitochondria, where it is going to be oxidized, basically, where we're going to break the bond, remove a carbon dioxide, take some electrons, uh, carry those electrons and hydrogen over to the electron transport chain. Okay, okay. Uh, then we have, there's your little coenzyme, it's going to help the um, acetyl uh, enter into the Krebs cycle. So here we have the two carbons remaining enter into the Krebs cycle where some electron carriers will pick up electrons and hydrogens. We'll also have carbon dioxide be produced as a waste product during the Krebs cycle. So the main purpose of the Krebs cycle, though, is to get any remaining electrons or energy from our uh, food molecules. So by the end of the Krebs cycle, we can say that our food has been fully oxidized, meaning we have taken all the electrons that we possibly can and um, put them onto electron carriers that were carried over to the electron transport chain. So uh, let's go ahead though and uh, continue. So here we're gonna zoom into the matrix of the mitochondria and Okay, so if we look at the mitochondria, there's two membranes. You have the outer membrane and you have the inner membrane. The matrix is that yellow part. And then the space between the membranes is called the intermembrane space. So let's zoom in here. And I've color-coded it for you. So this top layer of fatty acids is, or phospholipids, is on the outside. And then here, this one is the inner membrane. Okay? So let's go ahead and see. Within the inner membrane, we have these proteins or enzymes. Uh, these proteins make up the electron transport chain. So uh, when electron carriers that are carrying electrons and hydrogens arrive at the ETC, they're going to donate their electrons into the electron transport chain as well as their hydrogen. If you're in advanced biology class, we call this the electron carrier is oxidized. So here, let's pay attention to what happens to the hydrogen. Oh, wait, it is aerobic respiration. So this is where we are breathing in our oxygen. Oxygen is very electronegative, and it's going to attract those electrons. Now, you can envision this kind of like if you hold two magnets apart from each other, how the magnets will attract to each other. Kind of think like how they pull towards each other. So here, this oxygen is going to pull the electrons down the electron transport chain. Now, technically, I should have just a single O negative there. Um, so now, this electron carrier is open and can be used again. Now, the next electron carrier is going to come. It's going to donate the electrons in. Now, look at the hydrogen. Get pumped up into that intermembrane space. So again, when the electron carriers donate their electrons into the ETC, it pumps the hydrogen ions into that intermembrane space. Now over here on my oxygen side, I only had one oxygen, but really like, I want you to envision an O negative gaining electrons and then moving out of the way and the next oxygen gaining electrons and the next one gaining electrons. Okay, uh, so here, over time, though, all of those electron carriers that we produced earlier on are bringing their electrons and their hydrogens to the electron transport chain. We create this high concentration or a lot of hydrogen ions in this intermembrane space. 
Now, if you can remember from any chemistry or physical science classes, these positive charges repel each other. They do not want to be crammed this close together. So if given a way out, they would escape. Um, however, these bilayers, these phospholipids, uh, these membranes, the plus charge is repelled. They can't just go through. They can't leak out. Um, but anyway, so let's go ahead and uh, talk about what happens next. Uh, so, sorry, that's for my students. Um, so now let's go ahead and um, see. Oh, sorry, I copy and pasted. We're going to look at it all over again. So again, the electrons are going to be donated from the electron carriers, and then the hydrogens are pumped up into the intermembrane space. The oxygen is very electronegative and attracts and pulls the electrons down. The oxygen is actually the final electron acceptor. It's the final thing to attract those electrons. Okay, okay. So remember, these are all the electrons we got from glucose and now being added to oxygen. So I'm going to go ahead and move my face a little bit. So now we have another protein, a very important protein called ATP synthase. Now ATP synthase is where ATP is going to be made. So we take our ADP and an inorganic phosphate, a freely floating phosphate. And what's going to happen is when these hydrogen ions flow through ATP synthase, ATP synthase turns like a turnstile. Now, I didn't know how to do that in PowerPoint, so you can see it just kind of wiggles a little bit. <laughs> That's to like imply that it's turning. And as it turns, it connects ADP to the phosphate. And so therefore forms ATP. Now, um, my PowerPoint right here, watch. The ATP and the phosphate do not go into ATP synthase even though they look like that. Really what I was trying to have happen was the ADP and phosphate join and become ATP. So uh, let's watch that one more time. So ADP and phosphate are joined together to form ATP. Now you've noticed that both my positively charged hydrogen ions that flowed through ATP synthase being positively charged, they are attracted to that very negative oxygen and electrons. So here you have the oxygen and the hydrogens, and this is where water comes from um, during the electron transport chain. So when we say water is produced by cellular respiration or aerobic respiration, here's how. You had the electrons uh, getting pulled by oxygen through the electron transport chain. Then the hydrogens that flow through ATP synthase attract to it, and they join together and form water. Now this process of hydrogen ions flowing through ATP synthase, producing ATP, actually produces a very large amount, between 28 to 32 ATP uh, for each molecule of glucose. I only have three here, but uh, it makes a lot. So the majority of our ATP is produced uh, in this step. Now if you're in advanced biology class, this flow of hydrogen ions is called chemiosmosis. And together, the electron transport chain and ATP synthase, or chemiosmosis, would be called oxidative phosphorylation. But if you're in a ninth grade class, I'm guessing you don't need to know that. All right, all right. So uh, some questions to think about is, where did the water come from? And how was ATP made? Okay, and that is it for the electron transport chain. Good job.